All right, everyone. Come on. Everyone clapping. Come on. All right, everyone have a good night. What I was thinking about doing is getting everyone to put their hands up and I was going to come through and high five it, but that's all right. Oh, yeah, it's so hopeless. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Mono. All right. There was a very good reason I did that, and it'll come clear later, even though it was a bit random now. That's uh, love generation. So we live in a generation which talks about love a lot, very accepting of everyone. We, you know, the idea is not to offend anyone, not to put judgment across, to love everyone as they are. We've all heard the saying, love is, love is, love. Um, I don't particularly want to talk about it, but the Bible does talk about love not, and that's what I want to talk about tonight, not necessarily love. So the Bible talks a lot about loving and not loving, and there's a particular scripture that talks about love not. In uh, 1 John, we read it in verse 2, love not the world, all the things that are in it. Just going to have a brief look at this. I'm going to look at what is the world. So that's one of the things we're going to look at. What is it to not love the world? Is God serious about it? Who's behind the world? And then you guys later will be talking about why, ways not to love the world as a discussion question. So we'll keep it moving along. So we're looking at loving not. So the world. In this very set of scripture in 1 John 2, it talks about things not to love. And the first thing it mentions is the lust of the flesh. Now, it's a good audience tonight because the lust of the flesh very, relates very well to young people because uh, the Bible talks about youthful lusts. And um, so that's things that tickle our natural emotion or nature. That's my definition of it for you. But um, you can think of your own thing. But it's something that drives your inner emotions, which, not, which aren't necessarily driven by God. And we can all think of it, and I'm not going to give you examples, but as you're growing up, you know, in a very, very simple way, you, you know, a guy looks at a girl at some age and goes, oh, she looks all right. And the girl looks back and he's, oh, he's hot. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden things start. So anyway, that, when you run with all those sort of things the wrong way, not gonna, as I said, I'm not going to give examples, but the world's very good at uh, these sort of things. Um, that's what we're talking about, the lust of the flesh. Things that, that draw our natural nature, that draw out a natural emotion to do that which is against God. In this very set, uh, very set of scriptures, it talks about the lust of the eyes. Now, this is a big one, and it sort of ties in a little bit with what Nathan was saying. Your eyes are the gateway to your mind. And so whatever you start running your eye over, and we live in a generation that accepts everything, and as a result, when you go and talk to people, when you're on your social media, when you're on Facebook, when you're on Instagram, all those things, that permeates through you. And so that all of a sudden, you'll be seeing things that your friends put up, your work colleagues put up, which not necessarily line up with the, the things of God. And we all know that you look at it long enough and it starts to churn in your mind. You start to ponder the things that, uh, that you see, which the Bible talks about is the lust of the eyes. And the last one is pride of life. Self-assured. You know that you're good, you're better than someone else, you, you know, whether that's through knowledge or power. You, you make yourself feel good because you're self-assured. You, you make yourself feel better than others. And you start to build up this pride that you somehow are more unique than someone else and that you are able and better than they are and you're happy to put other people down for it. So we're look, looking at the things of the world. Now, to love not. What is it to not love? What is that Bible actually referring to here in not loving? We'll amp up the meaning in the Amplified. It talks about not to cherish the world or the things in it. And it's a very good explanation because if we do it actually says the love of God is not in us it's interesting because we receive the Holy Spirit through we receive the Holy Spirit and it talks about the love of God coming within us but if we start to cherish the things of the world all of a sudden we we're losing connection with God because we're we're pulling that way it will come clear in a moment the original word the meaning of it when you look up the original Greek word, it talks about expressing an absolute denial for. That's what it means, to not, not love, express a denial for. I thought I'd come up with my own one. Hate it. That's what, the, that's what it actually is really talking about. And 
the basis I get that one from is read in Matthew how God talks about to love God or love mammon, mammon it, which is basically wealth. But in that sort of, um, the, the Bible sets precedents and patterns. So with the Bible saying, well, if you love God, you're not going to love wealth. If you love the wealth, you're actually not going to love God. It talks about if you draw close to one, you actually pull away from the other. And so that principle is the same. So we need to love not, we need to hate the world, as hard as that sounds. And, then, you know, that's totally against the grain of our generation is actually to hate. But there's very good reason for it. One big reason is this. God is super jealous. God actually is jealous about you and what you think and what you do and where you end up when Jesus Christ returns. I thought just as a natural example, we're talking about girls and boys and, you know, putting your eye across the room and going, oh, she looks all right. Well, say you're a guy and you've got a girlfriend. You're at some function and you leave your girlfriend, you go up to the bar and grab a couple of lemonades and as you turn around... <laughs> yes. As you turn around, this other guy has come up to your girlfriend and just run his arm over her and starts having a chat, nice and intimate and close. What would your reaction be? You can obviously think of it the other way. But it's, it's interesting. God's, God's no different. God is the same. God wants us to be his. He doesn't want to share us with other people. And so it's the same thing. God doesn't want to share us with the world because it doesn't work. So we're just going to look about loving not the world. So... We, the, question, the next question was, who's behind the world? I wasn't going to go too much into this one. Plain and simple, the Bible talks about it's Satan. Satan's other name is the devil. And it talks about how he's the prince of this world. And so Satan, God, sorry, Satan and God are complete opposites. It's the, they're competition. They're one's up this side and one is up that side. And um, you can't support both. You can't be a Crows fan, you can't be a Port fan, and you can't support both. You know, if you can't be a Manchester United fan and support Liverpool as well, it just doesn't happen. For those that follow Rail and Barker, that's the same principle. They're, they're two different political factions and they don't go together. God and, and Satan are two different, two different ideologies. Satan is the prince of this world, wants to drag you down. We, we heard about the fear and all those things that will bring you down to his level. And God wants to elevate us up and he wants us to be with him. I want to tell you a little story. I was I purchased a car the other day, and um, it was night time, and I got in it to take it home, and the radio was on, and I don't even know what uh, radio station it was, but um, there was two presenters, and then the um, producer came on shortly after. They were discussing. Uh, it was an Australian girl that who. There's a German website which is very. Uh, popular for what I'm going to talk about in a moment. And she has become the first Australian to basically give up her innocence for a large sum of money. And they started talking about it, and um, as you can imagine, it's pretty in your face. And one presenter was dead against it, 100%, just like, this is wrong. The other one was, yeah, it sounds wrong, it'd mess up with her head and all these sort of things. The producer comes on, and she's like, well, it's her body, she can do what she wants. And instantly, obviously, as a Christian, that jars... Anyway, they started talking, and um, her, re her answer to every time they brought up, you know, why it might not be good, and he, and he brought up all these things, you know, history about, um, anyway, I won't go into it. It's, um, but anyway, lots of different points, but she kept coming back and going, well, it's her body, she's allowed to do what she wants. In the end, she'd said it enough times, and they de delved so deep in it, they didn't actually have an answer back for her. Now, we know, and if we read the Bible, our body's not our own, it's God's. Plain and simple. And, that, and that, you know, there's no discussion. You don't even discuss that rubbish. But the world will discuss it, delve deeper. And we all know the, our eye is the gateway, our hearing. If we hear stuff long enough, we look at stuff long enough, we end up starting to question things that we shouldn't even question in the first place. God's got plain and easy things to accept, simple things that will make your life a lot easier. And all of a sudden we start delving in these questions which which bring bad results. I want to talk about Pentecost or the world of Pentecost. Um, I apologise in advance for not pulling any punches, but um, 
Pentecost. We're part of Pentecost, obviously. We know we've received the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost happened all those years ago in Acts chapter 2. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things that our Pentecostal friends do. And I'm going to lose, use the word Pentecost very loosely because obviously a lot of you know that a lot of them don't even, haven't even received the Holy Spirit. But they talk about this grace and this hope and the real love. And that's why I wanted Love Generation playing. And, you know, they sit there and the music's playing and the hands on the heart and they're up like this. And it was hard enough to get you guys to clap, let alone to get to that stage. But, um, <laughs> but these are their key words, you know, grace, hope. And they talk about real love. They flash it on the back of the screen and they say, oh, this is the real love. And it's interesting because you can't have God's love without the Holy Spirit. So a lot of them can't even get to that point. But they talk about these things. And it, it sounds amazing because we live in a world that wants to be so accepting that these are really good highlight words, things about God's grace, that he accepts people, that he can bring hope to your life, that he can bring love. And they leave out some of the weightier things. Like They'll never talk about what God doesn't want you to like. I just want to run through a couple of things they do. Any second now? Here we go. Fornication. What's that? Now, I think most of us would know what that is, but we're talking about having a relationship with someone outside of your marriage. You'll find, if you start talking around to some of your friends that go to these churches, they happily have relationships with all, you know, with their boyfriend, with their girlfriend, or with the girlfriends, depending on, you know, how everything's going. That's just the way it rolls. And we, we know, and the Bible is super clear on, on, on these sort of matters, yet these churches, they don't actually preach about that because they can't, because half the congregation is involved in all that sort of stuff. So it's, you know, this is one huge thing that's very clear. Another thing. Any second now. Okay. Can we get a new battery? Oh, it's gone. Sorry, let's see if we can go again. No. Oh, sorry. It's not coming up on my screen. That was the problem. All right. So the next one. Having a beverage. Alcohol was accepted. Most of them, were, uh, uh, you know, there will be some that won't drink alcohol, but most of them, alcohol is very readily accepted. Now, I'm not going to really talk about all the scriptural things about why alcohol is, is, is not wise and why the Lord doesn't want us to partake. But these are the sort of things. So having alcohol is fine. So what you'll do is you'll go to the nightclub the night before. You'll go to your Sunday meeting with your, you know, have your hire with your friends. You'll go to your church, your Pentecostal church. And then if you're lucky, you might just go down to the pub afterwards and have a drink to it all. And, you know, it'll be, it'll be fine. It won't be looked upon as anything wrong. Is that coming up? There we go. Who is actually the church? It's interesting. In a lot of these places, apart from only maybe... I don't know what the percentages are, but you can talk around whether half of them are spirit-filled, where a quarter of them are, or what it is. A lot of them, you know, what makes up the church? And the other thing is the church is so transient. I ended up finding out about a couple of girls that to go to different Pentecostal churches this week. And the churches are so transient. They go between church and church. So who is the church? Who's the pastor shepherding? Just little questions. Oh, okay, one back. And when they have the spiritual gifts, they don't have the spiritual gifts. There's no spiritual gifts. They can't operate them because they're not all the people who have received the Holy Spirit, so they just don't have them. So we'll scrap that one. But it's all okay because they baptize correctly. That's one thing they do do very well. They baptize correctly. However, if you're not baptized and the Lord returns next week, they're actually baptizing everyone on June the 20th this year. And there's going to be 20 or 30 of you are going to get baptized altogether. All of a sudden, you're in a little bit of trouble. So there's lots of different things. And uh, in the end, don't be a stick in the mud. Just enjoy the music. You go there, the music's good, it's fun. You know, you can have that, you know, thing. But in the end, when you mix all this together, it all leads to the, to the wrong things. And so the world of Pentecost ends up becoming the world. That's what it ends up being. And we are so different to that. We're so very different. So after going through loving not the world, and we read it out of 1 John 2 about the flesh and the lust of the eyes, 
the pride of life, all these things, what the world is, who's behind the world. The question I want to leave you with, which you can discuss a little bit later, is ways not to love the world. Maybe things we can do that are going to help us keep us on the right path and keep us loving God and not loving this world. I'll leave it there.